So good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. The kind request to participants, please be seated. The session is going to start now. Let the photo session be over then. So that the attention is focused. Participants, please be seated. Right. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Vanakam. Uh, I do hail from Tamil Nadu, but my, my Tamil is not so good because I've not practiced the speaking of Tamil. That's the problem. I've only lived in many other states except Tamil Nadu. Neither was I born here, by the way. But still, it's an honor, it's a privilege, and I want to specifically thank the government of Tamil Nadu, senior officers led by Dr. Selva Vinayakan, who's the director of public health. This, his team has worked under him. It's an amazing team, and you have an amazing uh, uh, you know, location here in Madurai. Uh, just to let you know, I retired just two months ago from UNICEF in Maharashtra. So when I speak today in this presentation, it will be about the work that UNICEF did in Maharashtra. When I say we, I would actually mean UNICEF, though I've retired two months, only two months ago. The habit will take some time to go off. So allow me for that. What I show you here is a contrast, it's a city of contrast which is a city of Mumbai in Nariman Point, a place you all will be familiar with. Yeah. So we have the high-rise buildings, which is very typical of urban areas, but you see just next to them, you also have the shanties. And this is the city of, para of paradoxes. And this will also give you a picture of whether urban development is a paradise or a paradox. And that's how the presentation is moving on. I would like to look at what is the global context and why there's a need to focus on urban development and within that urban health. So in, uh, we know that about more than half of the world's population by, 2020, uh, by the year 2020 is already living in urban areas. Now there's nothing wrong about people living in urban areas because it means better access to services, better health, better education, better livelihood. But the problem starts when we realize that one billion of those 4.4 billion living in urban areas actually live in the slums or in slum-like areas. And that population is expected to grow three times over to three billion by 2050. And that means that you have a huge problem staring at you globally. And if we want the SDG 11, which is about sustainable cities and communities to be achieved, we have to imagine and start acting on the urban population now, and especially the slum population. Now, UNICEF globally did a study of 70 countries in the world and found out that actually in 38% of those 70 countries that they surveyed, the urban poorest the lowest quintile, is faring worse off than the rural quintile of the same population, urban poorest versus rural. And if you look at where the indicators are worse, like if I would look at sanitation, you have 59, in 59% of the countries, sanitation was an issue. For immunization in 50% of the countries in urban areas, it was worse off than rural. That is what the first slide shows you. But the slide on your right, is actually telling you that in 24% of the countries, the urban poor, when compared to the rural poor, were worse off. So one is to compare urban poorest with rural, and the second is to look at urban poor versus rural poor. Even there, the urban poor, whether it is immunization, if you look at, it is very, only in 28% of the countries surveyed, immunization is worse off in urban poor than in rural poor. If you look at mortality, you have 24% of children under five dying in these 24% of the countries in urban poor compared to rural. It means 
you have a problem and urban mortality or under five mortality is an indicator of several other deprivations, not only in health, in water supply, sanitation, nutrition, education, but all of that reflect in under five mortality. So this is the global context. Let's zoom down to India and see where are we. In terms of sheer numbers, Maharashtra, of course, tops the list in terms of the number of urban population with Assam at the other spectrum. But Tamil Nadu is not far behind. You're the third most urbanized state. But when you look at it as a proportion to the total population, you are already having 53%, more than 53% of your population living in urban areas. That is a call for action. Because urban is not about the high-rise building I showed you earlier. Urban is about the slums. Urban is about the slum-like. Urban is about vulnerable population. And that is why it's a wake-up call to look at urban health. What is the trends in India? We know that from over the successive census periods, and we have the last is only 2011, we had 377 million population in India, which constitutes roughly 31%. But as per projections globally and as per the Ministry of Health and Urban Affairs, Government of India, India's urban population is likely to cross 50% by 2051. Again, the fact is that it's not about the urban, but then look at the slum population. There is in the world, we have 33% of the population to be living in slums, but in India we're already near to 30%. And this 30%, by the way, only talks of the notified slums. We do not have information about slums which are not authorized and how people live there or live there from hand to mouth. We do not have. Plus, we also know that there are so many agencies collecting data on urban that there needs to be a collation or a triangulation between the different agencies. They also believe that since urban population is educated, so they'll have better information to whatever be the pandemic, the vaccination, the, uh, all the other uh, diseases that can come out should there be a, you know, a flood-like situation that we witnessed in Chennai recently, there is a myth that urban areas are better aware, they are better informed. There is also a myth that urban areas, because of better employment, have higher purchasing power, so they can buy what they want and therefore are living a basic standard of life. Plus, there's also the fact that, the myth that health healthcare services are actually available at the doorstep, and so they can get services whenever they want and in, in good quality. These are all actually the general perception. What is the reality on the ground is what you see in front of you, where there's a huge informal sector, which is largely dependent on wage, wage earnings, whether it is even rag picking, whether it is tanning in the leather mines to make the sandals that we wear or the handbags that we carry. The indicators of health for slums are always worse off than that for the rural. There's a lot of overcrowding in urban population and I refer to one slum called Dharavi. You must be aware, you must have heard about it. We have a population density of 90,000 persons per square kilometer. And the houses are 10 by 10. There's no kitchen, there's no bathroom. And it is largely for the, yes, and there's only for the migrant population who come and they sleep like this. If 10 people, men sleep, that's the house. That's all the spaces. So this is what overcrowding does to urban areas. Then you have, in addition, the higher triple burden of diseases, especially in urban areas, which is both communicable that we spoke of earlier, non-communicable, which is actually seeing a big trend in urban areas, and of course, malnutrition. Because there is a difference between hunger and nourishment. And parents in urban areas, in order to satiate the hunger for their children, give them the 10 rupees, the 20 rupees, and they go and buy the chips or the biscuit in the shops nearby. That is not nourishment. That's only satiating the hunger. And hence, malnutrition and obesity that DPH sir said in the morning is very typical of urban areas here. Vital indicators are actually calculated for the entire urban population without disaggregating slums. So the slums has a very different demographic profile. Very poor access to sanitation and safe water, and like I've said, disaggregated data for urban slums not available. I come down to Maharashtra itself, where what you can see is that between 61 census and 2011 census, the state has seen a 354% increase in urban population. 
And out of the five crores that you see in 2011, we have two crores living in the slums. And we have two districts that, uh, I mean, if this highlighter was working, I would have shown Mumbai and Nav Navi Mumbai on the green, they are entirely 100% urban districts. There is no panchayat there. There is no village there. It is 100% urban. So this is the kind of urban situation in which we decided to uh, you know, launch the urban program. When you look at rural urban differences according to NFHS 5, for most of the indicators, whether it is sex ratio, blood sugar, elevated blood sugar, institutional births, fully vaccinated children, you'll see that urban fares less than rural. Therefore, we decided how do we help the government of Maharashtra in the public health department to support what is called Ward Health Action Plan. That is WHAP, W-H-A-P. How we started was we started with a scoping of all the interested departments, academia, experts, and we had a consultation on what ails women and children in urban areas without referring to health nutrition. We called all the line departments and sought their views. From there, we started an evidence building because that was the main thing. The data was dis not available, disaggregated. So we looked at what is called a health facility assessment of 470 such health facilities in Bombay. And we used the IPHS standard 22, but also added a few more indicators, including water supply sanitation, which was missing. We got it uh, from the NHSRC at that time, and uh, Dr. Himan Shubhushan was also with us when we started this process. We did uh, the household well-being index that was developed for urban areas, and most interestingly, used artificial intelligence, something that the DPHR alluded to, we use Google Plus code maps to identify who is vulnerable in urban areas. And I will show you the very next slide. So these are some of the things we did for evidence building, and it is possible to do. So what I'm showing you here is actually to show that it is possible to do anywhere. And in terms of budgeting, we looked at where does the 15th Finance Commission budget come for, for health wellness centers? Where does it go to? Where should it have gone to? Where are the gaps? That kind of analysis actually help the corporations to invest in <coughs> sorry can i get some work oh, okay should be investing then in june of last year we nhsrc nuhm and unicef got together to develop what is called a city health action plan initiative or, or chap we called it chap for short City Health Action Plan. And it is there we called all the municipal corporations of the state, not just Mumbai. So all the, across the state, and Dr. Himan Shubhushan was also there. So that is when we developed a format, asked them to fill it up over two days, and the realization dawned that a City Health Action Plan is not possible unless you go granular, go down to the wards that constitute that city. And hence was born the idea of a Ward Health Action Plan. And right now, as I speak to you, we are, we meaning now UNICEF Maharashtra is working to develop a standard operating procedure for the Ward Health Action Plan, which will comprise of a situation analysis ward by ward. It will give evidence, it will provide an operational plan, and hoping to narrow the disparities between one ward and the other in terms of indicators. And this is work that has started in one municipal corporation it is called Pimpri Chinchwad Municipal Corporation in Pune District with a population of about 25 lakhs as we speak in 2023. But why we selected PCMC, the Pimpri Chinchwad Municipal Corporation, is because nearly 40% of that population is in urban slums or in slum-like situation. They have construction sites. They don't have data for what kind of vulnerabilities are there. Many number, names of households are not registered. So we therefore took that up as piloting, and we hope that this SOP that will be developed with NHSRC, NUHM, the additional chief secretary, health government of Maharashtra, UNICEF, and Yashada, which is like a nodal training institute. You know, like you have um, NIRD in uh, Hyderabad, you have Yashada also for training the urban local bodies. So there is an MOU that has been signed between these five parties to develop, test, validate, and take to scale the SOP. So we will stage one, we will do PCMC, 
Stage two will do a few more urban local bodies, and then it will go outside uh, throughout Maharashtra, and then with Government of India and HSRC support, it will go across the state as well. So this is some of the evidence I spoke about a vulnerability assessment. This is what it looks like. And again, this is an NHSRC format where we looked at four types of vulnerability as outlined by NHSRC, which is residential. Definition being people who don't have a house of their own, which is living in a tenant, I mean, living as a tenant, living without a kitchen, living without water supply, then those households are termed more residentially vulnerable. Social vulnerability are those who either are scheduled caste, scheduled tribe, do not have a ration card, things like that, then they are termed socially vulnerable. Occupational is those who work in uh, very hazardous industries within their homes, like the tanning I spoke about, where the leather is tanned in the home itself, uh, you know, and, and belt making, all these hazardous industries within the home, so it is not very good for the health. Those are the ones which are in occupational, or they don't have skills or semi-skilled, unskilled labor. That comes as occupational vulnerability. And health, of course, is where the distance to the nearest health facility is quite far, where there are alcohol takers, there are drug abusers, drug takers, and therefore they don't avail the services, or even if they avail, it's not, they don't avail for the things that they have, the complaints. So those are all the health vulnerable. So these are the four types. And if you see what, this was done across 1,13,000 households in the state, across Nasik, Aurangabad, Bombay, uh, Pune. So there were different municipal corporations. What this shows you is that social vulnerability, the one that you see in red outside, is the highest vulnerability. That means those who don't have a ration card, who belong to a particular community, who are scheduled caste, scheduled tribe, are more vulnerable than the others. And after social comes health, and after health, residential, and then comes occupational. Now, this kind of a qualitative analysis based on an NHSRC uh, format that's developed helps you actually understand where you should target for the out-of-reach population or those who would normally not access. Now, what happens? Yeah. This is the use of artificial intelligence, the Google Plus codes that I told you. So we used Google Plus, we partnered with them, and tried to find out who were the missed out children for immunization, pentavalent vaccine. Who were the women who were pregnant but did not take ANC service? That is the next slide. But all the greens you see here is the good part of the story, that within that slum, and this is in one ward, L ward in Bombay Municipal Corporation, the greens are all where the children have had at least one dose. But the orange is also there where either they don't have a card, so they could not say, and this is where you will be able to identify who are your zero dose children, either not fully immunized, under immunized, and therefore outside your, uh, mean therefore vulnerable to any other disease. So the, your immunity is already at question here. So this kind of a map actually helps health workers to zoom in on those households to provide that service. So this is for immunization. This is for ANC registration. So this is in Nasik Municipal Corporation. Again, you have 80, uh, about 78% where the ANC registration is done. But there are, for the remaining 23%, why they did not do is either because they left their parental home or their married home and they've come here for delivery. So they don't have the card with them. They, they're, or they feel this is the fourth or the fifth pregnancy, they're embarrassed to go to the health facility to register. But these are the reasons that we have now found out and helped the health workers to track how do you reach out to these households as well. So this is one example of use of artificial intelligence. Next, please. I think this one's battery has died. So what the World Health Action Plan is all about is it is actually based on the WHO UNICEF primary healthcare model as also what NUHM is uh, advocating for. It looks at the whole of society approach which provides accessible, affordable, and equitable healthcare. And it is based on good governance, quality service delivery, finance, human resources, capacity building, data, and most importantly, community participation. Most often, we plan for others without engaging them in decisions that affect their life. So community participation is also an important thing. The next, please. So it, what does the Ward Health Action Plan constitute? 
is basically answering these questions. What services are required? Who actually requires them? Who is unable to access? So we look at more from a deprivation angle and how do you address that deprivation that is on community? What public health services are currently available and what is the prospective plan for expanding? How do you improve the quality of services? How do you look at the economic burden of reducing the current out-of-pocket expenditure? What part of the disease burden could have been prevented or can going further be prevented through public policies and developing an accountability matrix saying who is responsible for what in that ward? So these are the things that the Ward Health Action Plan is developing an SOP for. Next, please. So in the PCMC example that I told you where we are piloting, it's based on three pillars. One is urban governance, where till now there was nothing called a multi-sectoral approach. Today, thanks to this intervention, ward level committees have been formed, which cuts across woman and child, social welfare, public health, all the departments that need to be get involved in a ward level, and it is headed by the assistant municipal commissioner. He has been given, he or she has been given additional financial powers which never existed before to take on or to invest in activities that are required as per the Ward Health Action Plan. And most importantly, the delimitation of wards to link it to the nearest health facility is an exercise that has started. Because health facilities developed based on population norm, but, that, but where the habitation lives and whether that comes in Ward X or Ward Y and whether there's a health facility there, that realignment is now happening, defining the boundaries of the ward to the health facility. So this is some examples of urban governance. Examples of health system strengthening is establishing the urban health wellness centers closer to where the population is, that is a vulnerable population, and strengthening what is called Mahila Arogya Samitis, which I think is nationwide, they call it MAS, and supporting the urban health nutrition days in urban areas and developing SOPs for conducting uh, urban health sanitation, nutrition days, and training calendars so that the urban uh, functionaries know what to do in conducting a UHSND. So that is part of the health systems. And since this municipality has a lot of corporate sector and there was a lot of talk in the morning about working with private sector, the part of the SOP is how do you engage with private sector. In terms of leveraging municipal budgets, we have, the commissioner has allocated a lump sum, one time 25 lakhs to the additional municipal commissioners for the respective wards to do the investment that is necessary based on whatever is the gap that is identified. And also track with your investment what outcomes has it led to. Has it led to a reduction in waterborne diseases? Has it led to in increase in institutional deliveries? So this is the part of tracking outlays to outcomes. Next, please. And in terms of a structure for supporting the Ward Health Action Plan, we have uh, developed for the SOP, we have a letter of intent, like I said, signed between five, four partners. There's an Urban Health Advisory Committee. Then it has two working groups, one for developing the SOP working group and the other one for developing for the community engagement. And then quarterly reviews of this SOP is underway. And while this is happening on the left, on the right, what you see in green, is already going on. The PCMC ward committees are already being formed. Ward health action plan is developed with the ward committees and the plan will be implemented. But as I speak, it is only six months of progress that I'm showing you. And as we go further, you'll be able to hear more. And then that will lead to city officials to develop their city plan. So we are at the level of ward health action plan for all wards of PCMC. Next. So if you look at what could be a way forward, I would look at it as four pillars. One, definitely need to understand the governance in urban areas before we jump into urban health. And you need to understand different forms of decentralization, especially for the urban local bodies and their capacities to even understand, leave alone implement urban programs. It, the second one <coughs> might not apply here because you don't have a large tribal population, but across the country where you have, and for Maharashtra, we have the second largest after MP, to look at even in Schedule 5 and Schedule 6 areas of the Constitution which have tribal population, there are urban areas within that which also have to be delimited so that you can link to the facilities. How do you reflect, how do you ensure that urban issues are reflected in the budgets of the annual PIP? So 
It should not just be an urban development department program, but it should be urban should be in water supply, urban should be in woman and child, urban should be in health, likewise. And then the reconstitution of ward boundaries so that you optimize the vulnerability, you reduce the vulnerability and optimize the services for the vulnerable population. So that is on governance. Evidence building is to actually identify either through the vulnerability assessment that we did as to understand who is the most left out, who is the most excluded in an urban scenario, and understand what schemes are there. So I'll give you one example from the pandemic time. When we did in the Bombay Municipal Corporation the vulnerability, and we realized, and that is true for many corporations in the state, the population who go out to work as wage labor are not available during the day. The service providers are available only during the day, nine to five. So then there is a, a new scheme that started called evening clinics. Like Delhi started Mohalla clinics. We had a Bal Thakare clinic. Bal Thakare was an earlier leader and a former chief minister of the state years ago in his name. And so the workers open up and go to the homes or open their centers only in the evening when the parents return back to home. So that has helped actually access healthcare services. So that is one example of how do these schemes actually reach for whom they are intended. And what is needed is a better understanding of municipal budgets. We have a fairly good idea about central state share and how it goes to districts for the rural. But for the urban, I don't think it is as well understood. Models for building, for addressing inequities, urban has to be a multi-sectoral approach. It cannot be the Department of Public Health alone handling urban health. It has to be in line with the water supply, with the woman and child, if whoever is handling nutrition. It could be social welfare in the state, I don't know. But it has to be a multi-sectoral approach. And we have to use technology, like I showed you the use of Google Map, to track who is the most uh, you know, out of reach child or the out of reach household or the woman, pregnant woman who's not accessing ANC in order to address that inequity. And of course, community participation using a lot of faith-based leaders so that we get access to those services. Uh, next, I think that's the last slide. Yes, thank you so much. You want me to stay back or? <laughs> Thank you, Madam, for highlighting the challenges in urban health. Similar to Maharashtra, Tamil Nadu is one of the fastest uh, urbanizing state in, in the states in the country. We will build a better public health system through good governance, evidence building, bridging inequities, and community participation. Thank you. Thank you. We very questions. The, the house is open for questions. We cordially invite Dr. B. R. Gemini, sir, Joint Director of Public Health and Preventive Medicine, Primary Health Centers, to felicitate the speaker with a memento. <laughs> 